Please welcome your moderator, author of Politico Pulse, Dan Diamond. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this panel. And the clock is, is starting, so I guess we do have to, to start officially now. I'm Dan Diamond, the author of Politico Pulse, the morning newsletter on health policy and politics. I'm delighted to be on this, or moderating this distinguished panel. I'm not actually on it because I'm not a physician or a commissioner of public health, which most of this panel is. But we'll, we'll go from uh, my right to left on, on introductions, and then I have an opening question for the panel. But first, Dr. Gigi El Bayoumi, the founder of the Rodham Institute at GW. Welcome. Thank you. Laquandra Nesbitt, also a physician, head of the, oh wow, uh, director DC Department of Health. On my left, Dr. Jewel Mullen, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health, HHS. And then on the far left, Dr. Raul Pino, the Acting Commissioner, Connecticut Department of Public Health. Did I get all those titles right? Uh, I'm not acting anymore. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Last week. So. Yeah. I, if, if I was a better journalist, I would have known that than having it broken to me on the panel. Um, so my opening question to, to this group, and maybe we can start with, with Gigi, there's been so much focus on inequalities, on, on disparities in healthcare the past few years. This, this conference is even, I think, a sign of that. How much progress, actually, let me rephrase that a little bit. What grade would you give the progress that the health system health advocates have made on combating those disparities? And, and in your answer, maybe share a little bit about your perspective on why you think that is. Sure, it's my pleasure. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would say that the grade really depends on what aspect of the health system we're talking about. And really, to just speak about the health system in terms of the biomedical side would leave out the true place where it counts to give a grade, and that's really the community where there's a lot that's happening. And um, I think when you're looking at change in any problem, but a problem as complex as significant health disparities, um, and in Washington, D.C., although we are, have been voted the healthiest uh, or most active city, I should say, um, by one of the fitness groups, it doesn't, of course, tell the story because in Ward 8, D.C. is divided into eight wards, wards five through eight, but really wards seven and eight, separated by the Anacostia River, commonly known as east of the river or southeast, we have disparities where we're number one in HIV and our HIV rates are the same as Namibia. But the hopeful thing where I would say work in progress with the potential to get an A, but not there yet, is something that gets measured. It, it's not a linear. It, it's in fits and starts, just like anything, and then you'll see a quantum leap. So the good thing is there's an increasing recognition, I believe, um, and physicians, I think, were often the last to kind of, you know, get get convinced of these. Are certainly our nursing colleagues, social work colleagues, uh, uh, public health colleagues, medical anthropologists have been leading this charge for decades. Um, but understanding finally that it is the social determinants of health that makes the difference. Access, of course, is important. I myself am a survivor of breast cancer, and without the excellent care that I got, and I was a recipient of the Herceptin, which had just been approved, is great. Um, but I think that in, in truth, from the standpoint of the population, we are making strides. There's great leadership in the community, but the, the lens has to be at the community level, led by the community, not an imposition, and certainly in partnership. And just to close, um, the Rodham Institute is an action-oriented institute um, uh, dedicated to improving health equity in Washington, D.C., partnering in partnership with all of our colleagues in the city, from uh, people who are in community-based organizations, government, academic, really everybody. So if I I, I heard, You're going to pin me down. Yes, I am, actually. I can it feel it. Because it a lot like my report card. Progress yes. can be made, but if you had to give a grade, what would it be? Well, you can tell I was a soft grader, or I am a soft grader. Um, right now, um, I would say, because I have to put the potential in there, um, I would say for DC, C plus, B minus. 
because we, we recognize the problem and we certainly have leadership in place that is putting it as a priority. And let's, let's hear from that leadership. So, look, watch. Question to you. So, um, you know, when we look at it from a, a national perspective, uh, with any significant issue that you're trying to address, I, I think initially there becomes uh, the immediate response that people have to just start throwing solutions at the problem. And then you have a period of time where you're not moving the needle and people become a lot more intentional on in trying to understand the root causes of that particular issue where the mo needle hasn't been moved. Uh, and so where we are in terms of health disparities, which I tend to, with my team, think very much so about, that's just really us measuring, measuring whether or not these, ex these differences in health outcomes, whether you're looking at racial and ethnic minorities, whether you're looking at populations who have different abilities, whether or not you're looking at gender, whether or not you're looking at geogra geography, um, or a host of places or differences between population subgroups where you could measure difference. We have in this country, uh, initially when the disparities conversations were really picking up, we were looking at black-white differences. And a lot of the energy was focused on going into neighborhoods and communities of color and talking to those communities of color about their poor health outcomes in contrast to white Americans. And expecting that changes in behaviors amongst those populations alone would result in a closure of that disparity gap. And in that period of time, sort of a decade, 19, from 1990 to 2000, when research was done or surveys were done, we saw that the knowledge of disparities, the existence of disparities in this country, increased dramatically among African Americans or blacks, but did not increase dramatically among whites. At the same time, we didn't see a tremendous closure <laughs> in disparities among a lot of health conditions. So when we had to go back into our huddle, right, and really think very creatively about how we should be addressing disparities, we started getting more focused on equity and starting to have this very broad and open conversation about social determinants of health and how that impacts individuals' ability to be healthy. And when we started to broaden our conversations and broaden our scopes, recognizing that policy definitely has a place in this discussion, it's just not about people in communities or subpopulation groups who exhibit poor health outcomes simply changing their behavior or us creating different pathways or access to health care in particular that's going to eliminate those uh, disparities, but that we fundamentally have to, cha to, to change the inequitable environments that precipitate these disparities. So we have to double down on our investments in education. We have to double down on our investments in employment opportunities, job opportunities. We have to double down on our investments in economic development and communities that have suffered decades upon decades of economic disinvestment that result in these disparities. So broadening that lens to have a conversation about health inequities overall has really began to be part of this dialogue when we talk about health disparities. So because we've begun to do that um, more globally as a society, those conversations are being reflected in our, in our National Healthy People program, and we're having more of a comprehensive conversation about it, simply not placing the burden on our healthcare delivery system, but now engaging what we call a health and all policies approach, looking across the spectrum, and that's what we're doing here in D.C. And unfortunately, our mayor, who was scheduled to be on this panel, isn't here today, but it's one of the reasons why I chose to join her team, really employing this equity approach across all of the sectors and domains who have the ability to impact health. While we haven't closed those gaps, uh, we, those disparities exist, but we now have more of a recognition where we need to be placing our policy efforts. I'd give us a C um, nationally uh, because we haven't seen the results, but at least we're recognizing that we need to be placing more uh, the responsibility in places other than just simply healthcare. So someone who has a national perspective now at HHS, Jewel, but also coming from Connecticut, I, I think I just want to pass the question now to you. What sort of progress have we made and what grade would you give the health system? So I'm a really hard grader. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't ask for a dashboard. <laughs> so I'm going to say A and C plus. And, and a, a does not sound like a hard grade. It, it sounds I'm going to explain. So, and the reason I want to do that is I'm, 30 years ago when I was studying epidemiology, I was concerned that um, 
describing the health disparities was just going to be another phase. And that, you know, people would maybe move a little bit farther beyond where they were when I was in medical school almost 40 years ago, um, when oftentimes physicians concluded that their patients' poor health outcomes were a result of their patients' poor decisions and poor behaviors. And, and we've come so much farther since that time. And rather than have the study of health disparities and inequalities just be the issue for the group suffering the disparities, we have, I think, collectively seen national and local efforts that say people get that this is a societal problem. So that's where the A comes from. The A comes from being able to see um, addressing health disparities and health equity evident in Healthy People 2020, evident in the national prevention strategy that has a strategic direction around health equity, um, because those are calls to action for the entire nation. And I think the fact that we're even having this conversation is another example of how, of how people are rising to it. Yes. Now, the, the C plus comes from maybe the progress that we've made along the way in um, uh, taking what I still like to use, no pictures, but Dr. Frieden's Health Impact Pyramid, where when he first published um, a paper on that five or six years ago, uh, the suggestion was that public health didn't really work at the very base of the pyramid where social determinants resided. And even in a, a recent paper of his and in the work that so, much of us, so many of us do, we're, we're recognizing that the, the conversation isn't just around what public health can do and policy and systems change, but everybody really needs to look at their role in social determinants. And so the other C plus, as I think about it, might be that as we talk about it, you have all these health people up here, and um, I hope we have a follow-up conversation with other sectors who also contribute to that work at the base. Mm -hmm. And, and Raul? So I, I think it all depends who you ask. Uh, the situation is really that if you ask public health officials in Connecticut, we will tell you probably we are striving for a B. We have made so much effort. We have developed so many plans. We have developed so many interventions. And we have tried so hard to engage the community. But if you ask the community, then probably we'll get a D. Uh, if you ask a Afro-American female who arrived in a stage four with breast cancer because uh, didn't have an early diagnosis or treatment or couldn't access the services or didn't have the navigation services to understand the system, or if you look at minorities who arrive uh, in eight stages uh, at a higher percentage than other, um, because the same conditions, then you have to look into, uh, we are at a point that if we don't create a structural changes to our society, or the planning, all the intervention, everything that we have done is not going to give us any results. And we have seen some results at the macro level, but there are communities that continue to be isolated from those changes. And in reality, health disparities it is a concentration expression of social economics. Mm -hmm. So to Jules' point, we, we are doing much better on the understanding that this is an issue, um, that there are generational problems that will take a long time to overcome. I think I just want to throw it back now to, to Gigi. The Rodham Institute is about two years old, may give or take yep. uh, another couple months. Yep. What sort of progress can be made in combating these challenges even in the span of a few years, can you point to examples of how that has changed? Well, um, you know, our, our uh, changes or impact is modest. Um, we deliberately spent, I would say, the past two and a half years developing relationships. Um, we all know of the historic reasons why there's been a lot of distrust of the, especially the academic medical community. And so it was really important in creating the solutions, A, that we found out from the stakeholders, meaning everybody across the city, what the priority was. Can I, can I just push you on something? I sure. think I know the answer, but you said we, we know why there has been distrust of the academic oh, community because sure. of, of 
testing and trials that maybe didn't go anywhere? Well, I mean, look at when, when people go in to do research in the community, it's like, it's like boot camp, okay? Six weeks, you collect data, you do exercise, blah, 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 and then they're out. And this is particularly true of our most vulnerable community, Ward 8. I mean, this is exactly what I was told when I was getting to know people in Ward 8 in the community. So it's like when there's an opportunity and it's an opportunity that's weighted towards research, publications, prestige, whatever, promotion, then we've got best friends in Ward 8. But the minute that that's over, it's done, right? So just going and having a conversation about what our collective priorities were, setting up the math problem. You know, I always tell my students and residents, it's not a matter just of getting the right answer. How you set up that math problem is just as crucial. Because if you get the right answer, you'll know what the process was. If you did not get the right answer, you'll know what the process was. So our first question is, we said, we're interested in health equity, what should our focus be? And in Washington, D.C., in October of 2013, yes, 92 people agreed without anybody disagreeing that it should be education and food. So we set out to learn, to educate ourselves, to find the partners that want to work with us and vice versa. So we had a, for example, a kickoff of a beginning of a project that we're doing with Berry Farm, um, the community hub that's created there, and we were asked, we were invited to come in to help with a, with a health festival, which is just the kickoff, it's not a one-off, it's just the beginning. And it was the community that hired community health workers to do the questionnaire about what the priorities were and what they wanted there. So that was, I believe, a success. We brought 65 different community-based organizations from across the city. This was not a GW show. We brought 150 medical students and learners. So that, I think, is one success. Um, it is about relationships, first and foremost. The other thing that we've been doing is um, our pipeline programs for kids, again, modest, um, getting kids not only exposed to health careers with a capital H, but also getting them to get interested in health advocacy. So they work on a 12-week social impact project of their choosing. Last year they chose how healthy is a school lunch, how green space affects chronic disease, and sex trafficking, which they identified as an issue. So um, one of our kids got a full ride scholarship to University of Wisconsin. He then turned around and, and basically nominated one of his friends who's now at Bucknell. We've got two people that attended our lunch and learns that are in nursing school modest, but it's about creating the atmosphere. And we believe that change, you know, my, my dad is a, a physical chemist, and it's like watching crystal formation. Nothing happens, nothing happens. You see a crystal, and then all of a sudden, crystals are formed. But it's about the relationship. It's hard to follow a poignant anecdote like that, but the, um, <laughs> especially because I want to go a different way, but the, the, the image I had in my head when you were talking about Ward 8 is, is from a Kaiser Health News story that I, I think some of us talked about and, and saw, maybe folks in the audience saw too, on Baltimore uh, from a few weeks ago. I see some nodding heads. The neighborhood differences in outcomes and mortality, I mean, really just striking. And thinking about Ward 8 as yes. an outlier yes. and, in, and a place of, of concern, what can and what has the city done, Lafondra, to tackle those tough neighborhoods to get providers to pour resources in to the neighborhoods that really need them? So I'm, I'm going to ask you a, a question. I hope this isn't a follow-up free zone. But when you say to get providers to pour <laughs> resources in, how are you describing or defining providers in this, in this question? So <laughs> I guess I'm thinking about it from a few different angles. Uh, the the closest hospital to us is GW, for-profit hospital, certainly does fairly well financially. What does it mean for a hospital to be responsible to its community, especially if it's a not-for-profit hospital? How is that community defined? If the hospital is investing in cancer services, that might be for well-paying patients. How is it balancing that out with services for patients who might need primary care? And how can a city help steer providers to do more of that 
population health type work as opposed to just going after well-paying patients? I, I think that's one component, and maybe I can leave it there and throw it back to you. So, so one of the fundamental challenges we have and have had for decades in this country around health disparities is relying heavily on our health care delivery system to solve this problem. And so the reason why I asked you the follow-up question about providers is you can continue to focus on the hospitals and the health care systems as the solution to this problem. You will continue to get the same result. If we closed half of the hospitals in the District of Columbia, we would probably still have the same population health outcomes that we still have. They are not the drivers of health disparities in our community. Our drivers of health disparities in our community are related to social economic factors more so than they are related to health care access issues. We have tons of research that has been done nationally, not just in the District of Columbia, to prove this fact. When you look at the great equalizers, you are more likely to improve health outcomes by making investments in the education sector and by improving job opportunities and making investments in workforce development and affordable housing than by focusing on single point access to care and primary care. I'm not making a statement we need to neglect those issues, but I am making the statement that our singular focus on those particular issues are what blinds us to our higher impact areas. Dr. Mullen made the statement about the, the health impact pyramid, and that impact pyramid shows us that from a population health perspective, meaning that when I'm trying to improve the health outcomes of the 660,000 people who live in the District of Columbia, and not just Gigi, or Marcus or one individual, I have the greatest impact by driving resources to those social economic factors than I have by impacting one-to-one -one healthcare. So when we talk about what we've done in the District of Columbia, having a mayor who's committed to $100 million in the Housing Production Trust Fund, making unprecedented investments in education, and not only when we talk about the Housing Production Trust Fund, making sure that it's distributed equitably across all eight wards, which most people don't understand. Because if you want to use city resources, most people try to get you to use it where it's going to be the cheapest. But we are no longer consolidating poverty in the District of Columbia. So when we talk about having poorer health outcomes in wards 5, 7, and 8, it makes sense for us. If we're going to house our homeless in temporary emergency shelters, we're going to build those shelters in all eight wards, which means some of those shelters are going to be in high-cost ward 3 mm -hmm. and higher-cost ward 2 and high cost Ward 1 and 4. Yes, it would be cheaper for us to just build smaller shelters in Ward 7 and 8 where the cost of property is much lower, but we will be continuing to consolidate poverty and put people where they don't have access to resources like jobs, like transportation, like healthfully, health, healthful foods. And we don't want to continue to do that to our most vulnerable re residents. So we're making very concerted efforts. We're making investments in our public school system so that when people make neighborhood choice, they're getting access to high quality education regardless of the median income of the neighborhood surrounding that school. So when we go back to the issue of can you get access to a cancer center in your neighborhood, DC is 62 square miles. So when we talk about critical care access, in terms of whether or not it's urban or rural, D.C. is far different than when you're having this conversation in Mississippi, Louisiana, or any other place. The issues of access to care have more to do with whether or not you are publicly insured versus privately insured. And that fundamentally becomes an issue of the policy and administrative decisions being made by our providers and our, and our institutions more so than where we build our facilities. So the conversations are very complex mm -hmm. when we talk about health disparities and equities, but shifting to access points for care as being the focus of the dis this discussion has been where we have failed to adequately address it over time. And since I've been here for 31 years, I can tell you, DC has probably the best primary care coverage in the country because when people were diagnosed with AIDS, that was automatically mm -hmm. qualifying you for Medicaid. Furthermore, there are lots of primary care clinics in Ward 7 and 8. Absolutely. The income, uh, the uh, family income in Ward 8 is 22,000 family. In Ward 3, where I live, it's 220,000. And, and, and just, to, just to follow up on that point, 
DC has the highest number of beds, inpatient beds per capita in the country. We have the highest number of licensed physicians per capita. And we started to drill that down in our physician renewal to make sure that we didn't just have physicians who were licensed here and practiced in Maryland and Virginia. And when we do that, we still have more per capita. We drilled down to see if they were accepting public insurance, and they are. So we do have access to care issues, but they're not as um, stark as we try to lay that problem at the feet of our healthcare delivery system. It's rooted in some of the social challenges that we need to put, atten put the spotlight on and adequately address. So understanding that the world is bigger than just DC. <laughs> and we, have, we have the former and current public health commissioners of Connecticut. Jewel, Raul, what do we, what do you know about disparities having worked in Connecticut and how different an experience is it in a state like that versus in DC? So before I was from Connecticut, <laughs> I was really from New York, which is where, I, where I'm really from. So in 1986, I went from working at Bellevue Hospital to working in Central Virginia, 86, just at the beginning of being able to do HIV testing and counseling. Uh, working at Bellevue, access to some of my patients might have been impacted by things like whether or not the elevator broke and they lived on the 18th floor and could get down to actually get to their apartment. Mm -hmm. um, I got to Central Virginia. There were um, individuals who needed to come and talk to somebody about their HIV risk, and people said to me, you're from New York, you can talk to them. Patients who had access difficulties, maybe the, the, the trouble was they were driving from someplace in West Virginia to get to a tertiary care center. And, and so when, when we think about the broader context in which we acknowledge that there is a concentration of providers, primary care and subspecialists in urban and suburban areas, the story is very different for many rural populations for Native Americans and, and for others that we forget are out there in the rest of the country. And, and it's really important to remember that because um, what people might take for granted for to be able to go someplace that's LGBT friendly to address their primary care needs might be a lot easier here than it would be in many other places. And, and that's the another level of conversation and, and, and mm -hmm. inquiry in social science and public health that people are addressing now, but we need more attention there. Um, similarly, um, as long as we don't address transportation or connectivity when we think telehealth is a solution, but not if people aren't connected, mm -hmm. then that's gonna be a challenge too, as will be the ability to actually improve a healthcare workforce to make, um, and incent individuals to go and work in underserved areas in our country while they are also understandably pulled and driven to do that work outside of the US because we have so many places here that need their, that help too. Well, I, I think, uh, I totally agree. Um, I think another uh, aspect of this that we have failed or put too much emphasis in is race. Uh, disparities is more than a racial issue. And uh, when Dr. Mullen was the commissioner, I was the deputy coming from the city of Hartford, which is an urban center, uh, she used to say to me, now you are the deputy commissioner, you have to think about Connecticut. Forget about Hartford, Connecticut. Well, I didn't say forget about <laughs> Hartford. <laughs> No, I'd forget actually it, like forget to know more about sense, your, yeah. in the sense of your working the relationship and what you disagreed on. That would be interesting. Yeah, but, but, but also, and I have learned in the process is Connecticut, the east and the west, the west and the east corner of Connecticut, which is mainly Caucasian, you find the same disparities that you find in the city of Hartford. In some cases, even greater. And it has to do with how isolated these communities are from everything. And Connecticut is a small state. It's only 3.5 million people in Connecticut. So imagine this in a state that has 20 or 25 million people. The other issue that Dr. Mullen was uh, touching on is transportation. Because access to health care is, is more than having insurance. Insurance is just the car that opens the door and get the uh, payer engaged. 
the, the more complicated issue is socioeconomics and how we have perpetuated this through years and years. And what is happening in Connecticut also now is the consolidation of health systems. And you were mentioning for profits and non-profit. At least in Connecticut, there's not much difference mm -hmm. between a for-profit and non-profit hospital. Mm -hmm. They do the same. They maximize profits. The difference, one distribute, the other one doesn't. And you have seen the creation of uh, two major large health systems, Hartford Hospital and Yale New Haven, that are pulling resources and concentrate a specialization into a smaller and smaller locations so that they can maximize profits, making the argument that those who need it may travel to them. Mm -hmm. Well, no, they don't even know where the services are to begin with. They don't have the ability to navigate those services. Then you have language barriers, and to add, you add transportation, um, it's a catastrophe. But n not to defend the hospitals um, or let them off the hook. Someone should on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think you know one of the other things that we we confronted, and that's an issue nationally, is not thinking about access to care as access to a doctor, mm -hmm. you know, as a behavioral health specialist, an oral health care provider, all the assortment of mid-level providers. And there's so much talk about the, 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 um, the ways in which hospitals behave in the healthcare marketplace. Providers have their own behaviors in a healthcare marketplace right. as well. I'm getting heads nodding here. So the, the scope of practice issues that could, uh, that have the potential to improve access by allowing more people who go to school to learn how to take care of others to practice at the, the highest high peak of what they're trained to do become highly contentious because um, people want to protect their profession. And certainly, we shouldn't just say anybody can do anything, but in the notion of, of team-based care and, and maximizing systems to enable everybody to be as efficient and effective and compassionate and empathetic as they can be, we also need to, to confront that issue more. And if I would add, the National Medical Association, which was uh, formed when the AMA would not allow African American physicians to join, and I think has been just tremendous as a national organization to get health disparities on the agenda long before other larger institutions, before it became in vogue, issued a report on African American health in November of 2013. Health equity also, you, you touched on this, Dr. Jewell, about um, uh, the people that are the clinicians, whatever clinicians, we know when the numbers of, let's say, we'll take African Americans, for example, of physicians go up, the entire community where they practice as health goes up. Numbers do make a difference. Right now, in medical schools across the country, we're at an all-time low. 4% of all medical students right now are African Americans. Very different than when I was in school um, from 81 to 85. We, and, and, and numbers matter. In D.C., the turnover of people who work in frontline cl clinics, and most of them that are frontline clinicians are actually nurse practitioners, because they're dealing with all the other things that actually impact health, right? The burnout rate is very high every two years. So the, the, the complexity is there. I don't want to overstate the complexity because there are tremendous organizations locally doing incredible work going back to, it does not have to be a physician or even a clinician. Um, people uh, doing work and, and really tailoring things to the needs culturally, uh, socially, in a, in a culture with a capital C. Finally, I'll just say something about how it's not just about race. Ward three, the, one of the richest wards, there are seniors who are food insecure. So it's, it, you know, to say sort of a one-size-fits-all, I couldn't agree more. We've, we've talked a lot about the underlying problems, the need for terminology understanding. I, I know that we should focus also on what is working and what can be done to fix things. So maybe, you're all experts, maybe if we could just go down the panel, and I'll start with, start with you all, the intervention that you think is most promising 
to help address some of these underlying disparities in inequality. And I don't know if the Office of uh, Health Equity in Connecticut is an example of something that other states could do, but, but that comes to mind for me. The, whole of, the Office of Health Equity... Um, which, played, which Dr. Mullen yes, launched, I think? She yes, she created. What? <laughs> yes, she's created. <laughs> we needed to have one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she also was responsible uh, for creating the Connecticut Health of People 2020, which is a roadmap for Connecticut um, interventions on uh, health outcomes on where we want to get. I think where whatever intervention we design, what we have to do really is to engage the community and make them part of the process. Uh, what we have failed is to understand what the needs are because we are coming from the top telling them what to do, what do they need, without having consideration that food may be the issue in that community, of the lighting, uh, sidewalks, or other structural issues may be the reality for them every day. And <clears throat> we haven't touched bases on crime and uh, chronic stress and what it does. Because it's not only socioeconomics in the sense that you, uh, there are very good studies that have looked at Afro-American females who have um, a high economic status. And how the health outcomes with regard to low birth weight continue to be the same to those who have a very lower uh, socioeconomic status. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex issue. And one intervention will not fit at all, uh, for sure. Uh, what the health of, uh, healthcare, um, health equity of the office have done for Connecticut is to help us to integrate all the urgencies into the system. And how can we make clear to urban development, uh, to the transportation department, how can we infuse these issues into the daily planning activity right. and the structural part of the... One team running point yeah. on, on all of these issues. Yeah. And, and I realize not... Not everything can be fixed through one intervention, but I'm trying to put myself in the heads of folks in this room. And if there was one lesson, one, one tactic that all of you would recommend for folks who are, who are coming and then, then leaving and going, scattering back, what is that tactic? And now I, I guess, Jewel, anything that comes to mind for you? So the staying at the community solution level, um, what I see needing to happen, and I think some of the examples of success at the community level are where businesses, nonprofits, neighbors all see themselves as part of a community so that it's not as if those, those entities whose employees come and go and who maybe pay taxes in a town um, see the community as outside of their walls because they have to be a part of the solution. It's not as if their resources should just get sprinkled around the community for residents to fix things on their own. Uh, and with that, uh, state and local health or zoning or other solutions to improve enforcement of codes for housing, um, new educational opportunities are important, but it, community can't mean just community fix itself. Everybody needs to be at the table, all sectors. So how do you make that happen? Well, there have been examples of how that's worked through um, community um, uh, pilots that were funded through community uh, transformation grants, where people worked with their hospitals, their grocers, um, other local businesses um, to find the financial support, maybe donate the land, create community gardens, um, create shared use agreements so that um, people who didn't have a place to exercise could actually maybe use a school or another site after work where healthcare providers donated time and where people were trained to do community health work at the same time that there were local commitments to improve green space. And, and you know, I don't want to call out individual places, but there are funders who are even in places like Bridgeport, Connecticut, I think probably in Baltimore, um, Washington, D.C., demonstrating that how that can work. And then the question becomes, how much do we say this needs to happen one community at a time? Mm -hmm. And it does at the same time that we need those broader population health approaches. 
So I'm going to turn now, now to this side and again try to push on that one tactic right. or strategy. You can push, but you can't get an answer to it. And the reason why is because, <laughs> you know, cause, right, because I've been sitting here like, uh, so the answer I'm going to give you is because we have to be accepting of the fact that an op creating an operational framework for getting this work done is a solution. Excellent. That is an acceptable response to your question. So what Dr. Pino gave you is, is an appropriate response establishing an office of health equity or creating a multi-sector partnership for getting this work done is an appropriate solution or response. Health disparities don't just exist as a finite marker of a problem. They exist because of multi multifactorial contributions to a population or a community's health. So when you're talking about eliminating disparities or achieving health equity, you're talking about having to do that across multiple domains, having to do that because you're, cha you're, you're eliminating tobacco-related diseases, you're reducing obesity rates amongst children and adults, you're eliminating uh, late diagnosis of cancer, you're helping people get to resources in a timely fashion that would reduce or mitigate the impacts of chronic disease. There is not one single program like a community garden or a health fair, which I hate, but those types of things that can be brought to bear in a community that would solve all of those problems nor, nor and lead to the eliminating the, the disparities or achieving health equity. But if you created an operational framework where you brought together multi, multiple sectors like health, education, transportation, planning, economic development, and you engage the public sector, the business community, et cetera, to create this community shared agenda like what Dr. Mullen did in, in Connecticut to set reasonable goals for 2020, like what we did in Louisville, like what we did in DC. You actually have an operational framework to get this work done and it moves forward from that perspective. It, it creating a myopic myopic goals and perspectives I think is where people have failed on this work by saying we all need to come together with this single uh, thing in mind because if we all focus singularly then we can win. I think that's, that's where it fails. We all inherently are driven and motivated by different things and our collaborative efforts will help us to sustain our momentum if we can all say our singular goal is to eliminate disparities and achieve health equity. You allow people to rally under that framework and achieve big wins there. The, the thing is to not have a knee-jerk response and lose sight of where you're going to go, but engaging, engaging the right partners. So I, I feel like I've just adequately answered the question without saying, and to do that, you must have this specific program. For me, the program was creating an operational framework Modeling, modeling a local version of the National Prevention Council, creating a local version of the Healthy People 2020 plan, and using a collective impact approach to mobilize public, private, and academic partnerships. So understanding that not everyone <laughs> in the room. <laughs> it, it's, it's Julie, you want to help me out? No, 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 actually I want to help I, Dan I feel out. like I need the help, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Julie, yeah. she said she wants to help you out. Yeah. Because it's, it's not a bad question. <laughs> It's, I, a, it's, a, it's an appropriate question. I wasn't looking for <laughs> affirmation, but... That's okay. Can, can, can I, can I explain? Stop. No, no. Okay, I, I, I appreciate the help, especially from, from an HHS official, but the, the, the reason, LaQuandra, I was, I was asking that is not everyone in this room is a health commissioner. I realize right. we have three on the stage who can set up a framework, but there are lots of different folks who are engaging with discrete parts of the system, and if there is a tactic that you as experts say, this is something that's replicable. Take it back to your community. Use it as part of this overarching goal to address generational problems that we're not going to fix in a few years. That's, I think, what I'm, I'm trying to push for. So, so the answer, answer to that, so but my in her answer, answer, okay, if I can jump in, is that the very question, with all due respect, assumes certain parameters that are just not existing. And it's about a f building a foundation because, and it's about listening and learning. So if you're asking me what the one thing that we should all do, we should close our mouths more and listen more and listen to what the community identifies. Because let me tell you something, the community is very good at telling you what the problems are and the solutions. We're the ones that presume to know best and that's where we get into trouble. So listen and learn, and even if it's not exactly like what you would envision, I'll give you a specific example, 
the, allow somebody else to be in the driver's seat. Now this is more than just philosophy. It speaks to the foundation. You have to build a foundation that's gonna be sustainable if we're gonna replicate it elsewhere and not something that's gonna be like a movie set, right? Where there's great shiny, oh, look at what we're doing and nothing behind that. And that's gonna take time and commitment and a certain political orientation. Let's be real about that. I don't think that this conversation can happen if one of the people on the other side of the extreme crazy spectrum gets elected. It is a political perspective. But I'm gonna give you one, I'm going to give you one example. When we were doing, and it was just a kickoff, not a health fair, because it's a, we're doing, we're doing, no, no, because she's we, right. she's we, right. we she's promised, right. we promised we were not gonna do a health fair. Right. It is, it is cruel and unfair, and it was always about connecting people to care. So in our health fair, a festival rather, we, <laughs> see, I, I can't even help it, right? In our health festival, we had people from the mental health space, from health exchange, from Amerihealth. Health. So if we identified a problem, people could, could walk right over and get signed up. We had our children's van there to s get kids immunizations, but there. But in the planning, I remember having this conversation with one of the medical students. We need to have education on alcohol. I said, but that's not what people want. That's not their priority, but they need it. I said, so I'm gonna teach you something. I'm glad that you're open in what you're saying, but this is actually part of the crux of the problem. And that's hard because look at, as physicians, it's how we're trained for heaven's sakes. And I love pyramids, I'm partial to pyramids, but that thing where we're here at the top and everybody else bows, bowed, bows down to us is just not working. And we have to be humbled. And on, a, on some level, we have to start with physicians because we're part of the problem. Not that we are responsible wholly, but we yield so much power that we have to be humbled. And listening and learning and listening and learning is important. And believing and trusting that the community already has the answers. And it's just a matter of allowing them to take leadership. So what I'll say as a practical step is um, in some communities, because uh, part of what um, we talk about to your point, uh, Dan, in the, in the public health space is this, the, the need to be more um, uh, productive or to have more progress in the multi-sector uh, conversations and uh, moving those policy agendas forward. I've been fortunate in the in the two communities where I've had some success with it to have partners in those sectors who 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 really really get um, how their particular sectors uh, impact health and would independent of any conversation with me be able to think about transportation policy from the perspective of health or environmental policy from the perspective of health. And I recognize that not every community gets that. And I recognize that there may be people in this room who work in those, spe those spaces or who are in the private sector who may not necessarily um, immediately understand their role. Uh, the, the place where I would say, um, you know, if what's that one single thing, is if someone invites you to participate in a conversation, that means they recognize what your role is. We have this moniker, a health equity is everybody's work. So come to that, come to those meetings or come to that space with the understanding that someone's gonna coach you through that process. Many of us have no interest in converting your sector into a public health organization, right? In terms of a governmental public health organization. That's not our goal. Um, our goal is to get you to understand how your sector interfaces or interacts with public health or influences health outcomes and to see where the missions align and to be able to act more positively in the best interest of the community's health. And, and then to be able to advance to a place where those conversations are positive and constructive. Um, it's not to be able to bash and to be able to ridicule and to be able to demean. That's not the spirit in which many of those invitations are being sent. And so even if you don't see your place when those hands are extended, those invitations are given, accept them and then you'll grow and mature into those roles in that process. So I, I think having that 
um, open mind and space to be able to mutually design those things. The, the, my apprehension about saying, well, this specific transportation policy is the one you need to implement is because I think it has to be fashioned about your level of expertise in transportation and what you know about your community and working in partnership with the public health experts there. So if we had time and I had a whole slide deck here, I could give you examples of what's worked in other communities, but I'm very deferential to people working in partnership and doing the things that are right and best for their particular community. And, and in the spirit of being deferential, I think we're out of time. So <laughs> oh, thank you for joining, <laughs> Gigi. Thank you.